Hello. Hi, everyone. Hi, Elisa. Hello, everyone out there. Um, we are uh, here at the Instituto in Porto today hosting a, a talk by uh, Elisa Silva. And we are very, very glad to have Elisa virtually in our room here in um, the hall of our uh, Instituto. And um, I will make a very, very brief present uh, introduction uh, for those who don't know Elisa. And uh, from there we have uh, then uh, her presentation. Um, I'm first of all, very, very happy to have Elisa uh, this week, uh, especially to present her work because we are hosting a workshop with a very, very enthusiastic and energetic group in working in Bairro do Vial here in the central area of Porto. Uh, we have been uh, working for about three days now or four. And this talk can be, I think, uh, inspiring for us to really to feel what kind or what are the possibilities to work in a derelict neighborhood or a neighborhood that has a certain um, uh, ingenious and solutions, but also some um, precarious housing and some segregated communities and so on. Um, Elisa is a principal and founder of Enlace Arquitectura and Enlace Fundación, established in Caracas, Venezuela. Uh, the two entities work in tandem to advance the integration of cities, including informal settlements through participatory design processes and cultural programs. Uh, their work has received awards in numerous design uh, competitions and has been uh, presented in uh, several exhibitions and biennales and publications. Her, uh, well, their, their project is currently on display at the uh, uh, La Biennale di Venezia. And uh, Elisa has also uh, uh, taught and is teaching in several uh, schools, such as Princeton University, School of Architecture, uh, Daniel's Faculty of Architecture, Landscape Architecture and Design at the University of Toronto. And previously, she has taught at the Harvard University Graduate School of Design and the Simon Bolivar University in Caracas. And Elisa is also publishing books such as the very recent Pure Space, which is a beautiful book about public space in uh, Latin American cities. Um, she might touch on some of that work or at least the work that gave a kind of starting point for, for all, all that research in La Palomera, in Caracas. Um, so Elisa, thank you again. Sorry about this uh, minor delay. You know how we deal with technology here. It's still a process. <laughs> uh, so thanks and looking forward to hear your presentation. Well, uh, thank you, Paolo, for that very generous introduction. It's a pleasure to share this time with all of you. I have um, a great deal to share and to say that I think, uh, from my perspective, is, is fascinating and interesting. But I will try to keep it synthesized. Um, and maybe afterwards, if there are any doubts, please um, go ahead and, and ask questions of anything that I might go over too quickly right now. So I um, wanted to maybe concentrate this talk really on telling you a story about the Barrio La Palomera within Caracas. And just to start with the context, um, some of you guys might have family members in Caracas since uh, a few decades ago, uh, there was a very important uh, migration from Portugal to Venezuela. Um, the uh, city is in a valley that is, uh, that mountain is between a thousand and two thousand and some meters above the sea level. And just beyond it is the ocean. Um, it's a temperate sort of 21, 23 degrees year round and very lush vegetation because it's immersed in the tropics. This is also Caracas. Uh, half of the population lives in uh, barrios or favelas. Um, this is particularly uh, a, 
uh, an, an area of Caracas very much in the news recently um, called La Cota 905. And if you look at this map, all of the areas that you see highlighted in blue are uh, self-built neighborhoods, um, critical neighborhoods, if you'd like. They are, um, as we call them here, barrios. And what you see at the very top is the connection uh, through a, a, a highway and that crosses a few tunnels to the coast where the airport is, where beaches and the port lies. La Palomera, which is where we will be kind of concentrating our time today, is located on this uh, point down here where this red dotted line is. It is part of a larger municipality called Baruta, which once upon a time was a different township a colonial from the colonial times of the Spanish. So this would be the center of the town here, if you can see my cursor. Um, here would be Petare, which is another town. And down here is the town of Baruta. So the Barrio La Palomera, it um, is the southern side of a, of a town that had its kind of, you know, square uh, gridded formation, just like the plan of the Indies um, from Spanish times indicated. And it started growing in 1936. There's a church within this town that apparently owned or operated these lands and started allowing people to settle there, to have uh, small urban farms there, which we call conucos, and its process of settlement started. Here we see it as an aerial uh, photo, but it's not an aerial, this is actually an orthographic map produced from many, many photographs of a drone that create this sort of um, cloud of points and then that cloud of points which is based on images can produce an orthographic image so this is planimetric this is true to scale there are no deformations um, that would be associated with an aerial view and uh, that was key and i will come around to this uh, at another point uh, in the lecture just keep that in mind that this was um, kind of a very interesting production of planimetrics based on recent technology. Within La Palomera, there are many, many sectors, um, which you can see delimited here, more or less. Um, and uh, this would be the lowest point and it rises towards the south. And here there's a kind of a very interesting ridge along the edge that has a, a steep drop off. Along that ridge, some years ago in 2016, uh, we started then our relationship with the neighbors of La Palomera. And this was a place where they would collect waste that wasn't being used. Uh, there was no proper waste management in La Palomera to speak of. The neighbors had lived with this for 30 years. Um, in fact, uh, this ridge is very often used to kind of get rid of uh, debris from uh, construction work or waste. And the neighbors themselves decided, let's make this be a space for the kinds of public space activities that we had been talking about through a program uh, with another NGO. And uh, it produced this kind of participatory way of um, at least uh, being part of the pavement strategy. They also uh, help make a bench. Lots of work came from the children themselves because there's a school right next door. And this proved to be a very rewarding experience, both for the neighbors and, and for ourselves. We, we learned a lot for sure. Um, it has had its life of its own. And so the neighbors have added uh, a slide and others. They've also added a little chapel uh, in memory. And the plantings have grown, you know, to the point of really canceling out that former use that it has as a waste dump. And so um, another point that we started working with uh, the community in a sector a little bit further up was to negotiate with car owners who used to park right here under this beautiful tree and see, well, would it be possible to maybe consider this as a special place for public use, maybe for children to, to play with? 
And as Paolo mentioned, some of these experiences, but others in Latin America, there are 23 total experiences from uh, this publication called Peer Space, which is all about strategies for creating public space opportunities within um, barrios. This one's in Guayaquil, Ecuador, and it happens right on the edge of the water. It's a conservation uh, effort and also one of risk management because of the rising level of the estero or estuary, which affects the house. But I now come to our partners in what we've been working on in La Palomera. They're called Ciudad Laboratorio. And in parallel, they had been working with the community of El Calvario in this sort of annual opening of the doors. It's called Calvario Open Doors or Puertas Abiertas. And it consisted of just this one day of a parranda navideña for Christmas time, where all sorts of events were gonna to start to unfold, readings and of course the music itself, which does this sort of procession throughout the neighborhoods, but also concerts on people's um, rooftops or book readings, or people would make bakings and sell them that day. So it was this beautiful way for everyone in the city to come to know El Calvario. Well, we decided and had the opportunity to come together and start this program, which we called Integration Process Caracas, and tried to kind of spread our tentacles as far as wide as we could with schools and the community itself, obviously, and institutions, cultural institutions, art institutions, a lot of artists, um, journalists and uh, educators, and of course, the local municipality itself. So integration process Caracas begins with the reading of a manifesto by two very well-known artists, um, TV artists, um, who read this manifesto. And I will try to just kind of convey some of what it, uh, it, it, it includes, which is let's look at these territories differently. I mean, we have always, had an impositive kind of a um, hierarchical way of we, I say, those who do not live in the barrios and this we should be expanded into everyone in the city, I suppose, is the, uh, the end goal of, of this whole operation. So let's be more precise and say the non-barrio dwellers have tended to see this territory as one that needed order, but doesn't need order, it has one of its own, just needs kind of to look at it with different eyes, right? Does it need assistance? The barrio does not need to be intervened because it is neither sick nor a disease. So what then does the barrio need? It needs recognition from within, from outside, as part of the city. Continuing to think of the barrio as an urban malaise does not help to understand it as an active part of the city, as a walkable space lived by everyone. And this manifesto was then followed by um, an invitation of everyone who came along to come through the staircases of the barrio. Uh, we sang uh, decimas, which are kind of these rhymes that uh, Jose Perez wrote specifically for the barrio La Palomera. And then at the end, there was this dance that was choreographed by um, Mafed Absueta and Dora Peña, who are two contemporary dancers and allowed for uh, an exchange, let's say, between locals, uh, visitors, just a, a different way of, of um, experiencing the city, no? We then opened a call for artists to uh, begin to think about community-based projects. And one were two dancers, Harold and Maria Alejandra, who taught school children uh, in a contemporary way traditional dances, traditional music. And here they started to prepare for what's called the Tambores of San Millan. Another group, this is Dora and Mafer, again, the contemporary dancers, had a dynamic, very interesting, with children from a, um, um, a local soup kitchen. And other artists, including um, uh, Ambar Armas, worked with kids in a high school uh, making all sorts of engravings, as you see up at the top, some of them of views of La Palomera, and then writing a story that became a printed booklet. Another group surveyed the gardens of La Palomera, and we found that there were amazing uh, gardens and a lot of knowledge about planting, 
Uh, this was Gabriel Nas and Ambar Armas. And uh, photographing, then understanding better the, the kinds of species that were growing in each of their gardens. Other days, we opened um, walks and invited people to come all the way to the top and play bocci, as they call it in Italian, or la petanque in France, or bolas criollas, as we call it in Venezuela. And these are spaces that La Palomera, for example, has three of them, but you will be hard pressed to find them in the quote formal part of the city. And you know, as much fun as they are, why should they only be located in barrios? Um, these are the settings and the spaces and the public spaces that are already existing in the barrio that have not kind of been crafted by other than the neighbors themselves. And what we um, want to sort of ask ourselves is these are also public spaces, obviously, um, that we should you know, kind of acknowledge and celebrate as such. The Cross of May was a very important celebration of La Palomera that unfortunately they had not uh, had held for 20 years uh, due to financial kind of difficulty since this was something that they always did uh, by contributing as neighbors to this collective festivity. Well, we joined all of those art workshops that were happening and made them into sort of this open exhibition plus the celebration of the Cross of May, which you can see here, it's venerated in May. There are uh, songs, and more decimas that are sang to them. Many of them were actually written and spoken by children of La Palomera in this opportunity. We also made a gigantic model, measured something like three by four feet, four meters. And um, we had it become part of a procession that went from the Plaza Bolivar in Baruta up into the community and then reassembled. And so this signification of La Palomera is a neighborhood that is modeled just like any other part of the city could be modeled. And here we see a record of that procession coming up through La Palomera and then reassembled at the top. This is where that uh, plaza that I showed you guys earlier lies next to the uh, basketball court. And up here at the very top, you can see the swing sets that we saw before. So this is the model reassembled at the top and it was a way of having talks about, well, the origins of La Palomera and, and the nature of its spaces. And also its connection with its surroundings because it's not just La Palomera, but also the town of Baruta, the neighborhood behind Copia de Azul. Music is always a part of these festivities, lots of dancing. We had different, we have a calendar of all sorts of events that were happening, like contemporary dance with the children, a gallery of the photographs of the neighbors and lots of dancing. Um, the children who had been taught by Harold and Maria Handra actually led this procession from the cross into the basketball court. And here we all uh, followed in suit. The children led the uh, tambores of San Millan and then became a massive um, sort of moment that joined most people that came from outside of the barrio, from the rest of the city to share in this experience, as well as up from 200 of the neighbors of La Palomera participated as well. We then thought, well, what is the story of La Palomera? How was it begun? This isn't something that has been recorded. These oral histories of the founding members who could at least you know, begin, not maybe the founding members themselves, but their children or their grandchildren could uh, talk about what the barrio was like you know, 60 years ago, 80 years ago. Remember, Palomera was founded in 1937. So it is already a, a barrio that has, you know, up from, up, of, up from 80 years old. And here they are sitting, some of them uh, telling their stories to a larger audience. And the importance of, here's Reina Guzman over here, um, the importance of recording what is also the history of Caracas. So the one we know is the one written by the urbanists, the architects, the ones that followed the suit of the modern architecture movement, which is fantastic. And it is a beautiful chapter in Caracas's history. There's also a very important one that fed that modern movement and has not been recorded. So 
At the end of that, we had more dancing, in this case, one that's called Horopo, and uh, a photograph of the group together. And this is people from Enlace, from Ciudad Laboratorio, from the community, the artists who have become involved. It really is one large team. We had tours of the gardens where we invited outside landscape architects, botanical experts, and had a conversation with all the neighbors about their uh, experiences and their knowledge in plants. And then we synthesized this into its first iteration of an exhibition, which was called The Complete City, La Palomera, Acknowledgement and Recognition, which is in celebration, which is the title of this lecture as well. That model came into a very well-known cultural space in Caracas called La Hacienda de la Trinidad. That aerial, uh, that orthographic uh, plan that I mentioned earlier, we printed as a very large scale map on the floor um, so that people could walk on it, people could really get into it and find their homes, find their homes as part of the larger city. The uh, portraits of all of the garden owners were exhibited with their stories and people from La Palomera came who um, were seeing themselves re represented as a representation of acknowledgement, but one of also recognizing how special the knowledge that they have in this case about vegetation and cultivation and, and gardening. Um, could be for an outside audience and then most definitely perhaps resignified for themselves, right? And here are some of the members of the community finding their own faces. Here's Juan Amatos, as you can see, her self seeing herself. Um, then we also thought it was very important to record this experience in a way that could become an archive of sorts for other processes. And so here you see on the wall, a timeline of all the events that organically started to unfold as part of the integration process Caracas program. And on the bottom, you see the, the workshops with the artists and you see all the various events that took place with them. We have a series of these uh, findings and I mean, these are reunions, I'm sorry, that I mentioned earlier and others that I, didn't, don't want to take up to more time, but the larger celebrations, ensuing activities, and everybody involved. This we thought is each of these uh, folders encapsulates the photographs, the people who participated, the announcements, the receptivity, a bit of a description of what happened that day. And here you see it a little larger. Seeds from La Palomera were collected and presented. Um, we actually also have seeds now from La Palomera at the Venice Biennial um, being shown. And then an ethnobotanical dictionary of the plants of La Palomera. So at this moment, we have around 260 species that have been recorded with their description and how you cultivate them, but more importantly, their use. So some of them are culinary. Some of them can be used for uh, medicinal purposes. And this knowledge is what we have attempted to sort of systematize and celebrate again. And this was the, ver the, the version of the Ethnobotanical Dictionary as presented in Caracas in February 2020 at uh, La Trinidad. We also produced a newspaper with all of the good news about La Palomera and uh, was sort of distributed to everybody who came to the exhibition. And we talked about um, the initiatives that had happened, the celebration of the cross of May, but also a lot of things about the barrio itself, like, well, there's this idea that the homes in uh, the barrio are not sound or are insufficient in some way. And so trying to show and map as plans and as um, sections, the complexity of these homes as work live spaces that have gardens in themselves, so this is, for example, the house of um, Calixto Perez, who has a garden in the back. He also has chickens. He has a space where his daughter has um, um, plastic arts uh, kind of crafts um, workshops and a, and a gast gastronomical school in addition to, for, to this being their home. If you add up all these spaces, you have not only very flexible homes, which now since COVID we have learned are you know, even more valuable, 
but many, many square meters built of homes that represent something much more than what its comparable sort of social housing um, counterpart would, would represent. Um, we recorded how the, the height of the homes, we tried to record how much had been built and um, presented many findings about the Palomera in this newspaper. So I like this quote very much by Martha Nussbaum from Not for Profit, Why Democracy Needs the Humanities. The arts by generating pleasure in connection with acts of subversion and cultural reflection produce an enduring and even attractive dialogue with the prejudices of the past rather than one fraught with fear and defensiveness. So basically the, the agency of art in representing topics which people may have shortcomings or prejudices towards them is an amazing vehicle for, you know, sort of asking of a different mindset, asking to see again with new eyes. And so when we think about the complete city and this process that I just mentioned, it has opened paths of what this might begin to mean in, let's say, not only social and symbolic terms, which is what we've been talking about, but also in terms of how the city operates. One, for example, is the way waste is collected. Waste is collected very differently in the barrio because a truck, conventional waste garbage truck, cannot come through the tighter streets. Well, what we decided and were able to do with the private company called Pospuca that does the waste collection with um, the municipality is to devise routes through the um, barrio that would be manned by two people and door to door collection would take place that then at the bottom of the hill would be introduced directly into the garbage trucks. And that would allow us to uh, not only have a better service where right now or before this neighbors were asked to take this, their waste daily to a waste container at the foot of the barrio. But what you saw were all these clandestine waste mechanisms popping up here and there. Um, and this is the container at the foot of the barrio, which was for the neighbors right around them, kind of a nightmare in terms of public health, but also an, a terrible way of saying, you're welcome to the barrio, here is the waste container to let you know it. Um, not a very equitable way of managing services in one sector of the city versus another. So, uh, with this program in place after it had been operative for over 18 months, the container was removed and replaced with a garden, as you see here, this was kind of the operation. And the neighbors themselves participated in considering this with some apprehension, you know, they didn't want places for people to gather because, you know, the, 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 the men who drink too much come around at night. These are often, valid worries that neighbors have when you uh, propose to them something that's like a public space for gathering outside. But fortunately, this has been quite successful. Um, they, the neighbors continue to plant more. Um, it has grown and become more lush and other places in uh, the city are now very keen other barrios on having something similar applied to them. We continue to meet with uh, now uh, 16 people have been hired by Fospuca, many of them in, the, in La Palomera to be a part of this um, service. And uh, we're working with them actively to understand how to improve it, where are the hiccups still happening? Because this is really a pilot program uh, that can be replicated now elsewhere in the city. Up until now, Waste had been managed by a collector at the bottom of the hill, and, that, and that's it. And another part of this idea of the complete city is a space. It can be an existing space. It can be something that you have the opportunity to sort of build together that can continuously work as a hub for art and culture to raise these questions about what it means to integrate a city and what it means for us to erase these boundaries that exist and really conceive of it complete, whole, right? The neighbors showed us a space that we found to fortunately belong to the city, to the municipality of Baruta, 
And we're in the process, which began in October, 2019, and still today is part of this process of converting it into a center, permanent center for art and culture. But it started off as just an initiative to open the space, tear down some doors that had been closed shut for many years, maybe perhaps even 30, some uh, estimate. And something that had just been, you know, empty in a place that needs space and is so dense at the same time, just seemed criminal. We first decided to clean it up and have another big party. As I mentioned, this is kind of the late motif of, of our uh, relationship and, 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 and how, how this has snowballed into something much larger. So again, uh, the children who had learned dances began with a procession from the uh, Simon Bolivar Plaza into the uh, doors of the, um, of the center, kind of symbolizing the welcoming into the space for all neighbors and non-barrio residents by the children. And then we had a series of events of contemporary dance, um, music from uh, groups that are uh, from La Palomera, uh, videos and uh, art videos, and some that were records of our own um, events were shown. And again, just a, a sancocho was also uh, prepared. And the sancocho is sort of this Venezuelan stew that requires the participation of many who bring the pot and the caldo and the vegetables. and it um, has also been a late motif of all of our events as a way of sharing and as part of kind of a culinary culture. Children were here, adults were here. It was really an amazing opportunity. I'd like to now talk about what this could become. And there are amazing references such as uh, Teatro Oficina in Sao Paulo in Brazil, which is a project whose design in any case was put together by Lina Bobardi. There's Afro Reggae, which is another incredible institution in Rio de Janeiro, focused on uh, music and dance with children. It started as a way of mitigating uh, violence in a particular um, neighborhood called Vigario Geral. And with many other references that we collected last summer, uh, taking advantage of COVID, we started, uh, and because of COVID also digitally, trying to connect with people in the um, community as to, well, what are things going on? What would you like to happen in this space? So this is a Google doc that we circulated to try to get some answers. And we put pamphlets sort of in the same spirit of the newspaper to get, um, you know, to ask people to, to contact us. This is the space itself. And the idea is little by little with funds from uh, embassies and some grants, to uh, allow for this to become a habitable space. So what we've done so far is introduced restrooms, which they didn't have, and the staircase that connects the top and the bottom floor. Uh, a neighbor called William Diaz has been using this inter the kind of the, pa the patio or the courtyard space as a garden, um, and that will continue to uh, happen. And it can also be a place for concerts or for uh, theater. And a local theater group called Hestamani has also already been um, using it and rehearsing it. Uh, in the future, we hope that the culinary school that you saw earlier in Calixo's house could uh, take advantage of a larger space here. And uh, the rainwater collected on this roof will be stored and used to serve both filtered and to serve the, the bathrooms and the uh, kitchen. So here's the group Hestamani in COVID time. So Lots of social distancing happening here. Um, meetings by uh, another ally that we're working with for that project about uh, water collection called Cause. Here's William himself, who's the grandmaster uh, landscape architect of all these spaces uh, in the garden. And um, yeah, just basically everybody participating in giving ideas. So for example, this roof, we couldn't keep the tiles, they were all too uh, deteriorated and the leaf and the roof was leaky. So we had to remove them. Um, some were uh, kept, but not enough to cover the whole roof. So the idea came of, well, why not covering it with this sort of um, blanket of, of, um, of vegetation? 
And this is a recent photograph. So it's actually already crept up quite a bit. And um, the idea is here, you know, there are little interventions that pop up here and there of people leaving their mark on the place. And that's, that's precisely the idea. We also learned from one of the neighbors about bamboo and harvesting bamboo and producing things with bamboo. So one of our team members um, who had been doing the mapping of the gardens, Gabriel Nas, has been in the process of giving a, a bamboo workshop. Many neighbors have been participating and learning how to cure the bamboo so that it doesn't um, get infested with uh, termites, et cetera, drawing it and then playing and learning of ways to work with the bamboo. We, we do expect this to become the cover underneath that protects uh, the roof structure. Here you see that staircase that what I was mentioning and some neighbors who brought flower pots that have already been uh, added. This is the carpenter Augusto who's made the benches. I'm not sure if there were benches around in many of these photographs. Um, yeah, here's one. You can barely see one of these benches over here, but he's made several. Um, and we're about to start now with the water collection process. The roof is actually under construction at this moment. And some of the ideas is to have it in a higher cistern to work as gravity, but there's also an existing tank that might operate with a bicycle or a seesaw or a hand pump. And so to end and um, give us some opportunities for questions, I uh, feel that this conversation about the complete city is very much one that happens inside the barrio and outside of the barrio. Inside in a sense to uh, see themselves in their kind of uh, virtues, their knowledge, their culture, which I have to say is much richer than say, you know, other neighborhoods in the city might um, be able to, to share. Um, the camaraderie, the, the sense of neighborliness. There's, there's so many attributes that when people come and participate, for example, in the, in the center, they get a glimpse of that and can learn from it and can actually even envy it for their own community. But I also feel that it's this story that we are layering with many angles. The plants is one of them that I find to be very, very um, powerful because it goes across not only limits within the city, but across regions, across nations. Our plant culture in Venezuela is actually a very beautiful testament of all the waves of migration that came. We have plants here that grow that are not indigenous to, um, to Venezuela. Um, and as we did this research, it was very interesting to find that. So it was here presented at the biennials, part of that ethnobotanical dictionary and also a representation in this model of that garden, public space, walkway, these open spaces in the barrio, which are different, but no less, um, um, let's say, uh, layered with meaning of, of urbanity. Um, we tried also to uh, convey that with these uh, axonometric drawings that detail each garden that was surveyed um, as they are. So, Instead of producing a drawing to make a landscape, this landscape is registered in a drawing as is to be somehow celebrated in the same representation mode. Um, the model's eight meters by four and a half at one to 30 scale, which allows for a very good interaction um, with the size, for example, of that uh, stair, of that, um, a swing set that I showed you earlier, and here's the small little plaza that the children and the uh, basketball court. This is Williams, Conuco, uh, some of the uh, bolas criollas, the, the bachi courts. Um, and so to end, I, I, I very much think that it, th this is really a matter also of uh, resignifying the territories that have been discriminated, just as maybe we did uh, and still are doing in terms of gender. And I quote Judith Butler, who is a, um, a feminist and who has studied very much this sort of Derridian um, deconstruction of, of, of gender, but let's not think of it in gender. Let's just think of it as people who live in different parts of the city. 
The task here is not to celebrate each and every new possibility, qua possibility, but to re-describe those possibilities that already exist, but which exist within cultural domains designed as culturally unintelligible and impossible. If identities were no longer fixed as the premises of a political syllogism and politics no longer understood as a set of practices derived from the alleged interests that belong to a set of ready-made subjects, so the dominating subjects, a new configuration of politics would surely emerge from the ruins of the old. Yet another image. I wanted to share with you the record of all of this, lapalomera.org. It accompanies the exhibition, actually, with um, NFC codes that take you into the uh, website. So here you would find absolutely everything that I explained and even more. Um, and um, muito obrigado. I'll stop sharing now. <laughs>